In the talk preceding this talk, we spoke about the current period, the Earth period. It is when we have become human, and uh, we talked about that period being very special. The Earth period, we said, was special because it marks the end of the completely involutionary phase and the beginning of moving toward the completely evolutionary phase. And because it is the present, and the present is all important, it is all important because it deals with what we're working on now. It is a pivot because the uh, macrocosm will not continue to become increasingly dense. In fact, in the first half of evolution it did that, and now in the second half it will become again increasingly rare. In the next period, which is called the Jupiter period, the whole uh, cosmos will be manifest only as deeply as the ether, which is about as deep as uh, an electromagnetic field in the scientific parlance. This is the way it was back in the Sun period. The uh, Venus period, which is the next period after that, the whole cosmos will only be as dense as a desire. The way it was, that, that, the, that is reflected in the Sun period. The Jupiter period, when we are etheric, will be reflected into the Moon period. And in the final period, the whole cosmos will only be as dense as a concrete thought. The all-important concrete thought we began talking about last evening. Now, there is this kind of a symmetry. We follow the same path out of matter in a reflective way that we followed while passing into it. So if you're interested in mathematics, it's probably uh, symmetry across the axis is the way it's pictured. Uh, because our human life wave, like every other human life wave, uh, whether those whether the life wave is of creatures or of creators, builds its vehicles of consciousness and its experience of consciousness out of the macrocosmic world, you're not going to be able to very long continue to build dense physical bodies made out of the chemical stuff like the ones we have right now. We will build our bodies out of increasingly finer stuff all the time. That would be very wonderful because we'll be able to do all kinds of things that we can't do because of the limitations here. Of course, it will mean that we'll have to have impeccable control because everything is going to be more and more subtle and more and more will over the wisp and more hard to get a hold of. Now that's what our future is like. Now the Rosicrucian seers and they founded the uh, Rosicrucian order, which the Rosicrucian fellowship follows, claims that the dense physical body, this thing that we see and that many people think is our only existence, has reached its full maturity. It is in its fourth stage. It is in its human stage. And after that, after a vehicle has reached its maturity, it goes into decadence. That doesn't mean that it will become fat and lazy and weak or anything like that, but that the form will become less detailed, less uh, concrete. And in effect, everything that we have learned in building this body, all of the experiences or the essence of the experiences will be built as soul material into the spirit so that nothing of this is lost. But at the same time, once this vehicle is finished, it is used. The principles in it are used. 
So when there is no more physical earth period, when there is no more dense stuff like this, the principles that are used in the dense physical body get built into our etheric body, which means it will then have the quality of life and all the qualities of shape that we that it now have. So this is a bit quite a remarkable vehicle when it has these things. And in a similar or in an analogous way, each of the bodies as it becomes uh, completely mature and it and the world it corresponds to are no longer necessary, it gets built into the next higher vehicle. Until eventually, everything, all of our vehicles, desire, uh, vitality, and physicality get built into the mind from which they issued in the first place, and the mind itself becomes mature and it uh, falls back into the spirit. Well, this is what our future is like. We can't invest too much in uh, our dense physical body because that's not going to uh, uh, that's not going to be the future. Now, we're trying to get at consciousness. The purpose of these talks is to understand consciousness. And we said in several times in preceding talks, uh, especially in the talk yesterday that uh, it is in the dense physical body that we awaken objective self-consciousness. We talked about it in terms of focus through the mind. Now, in the first talk in this series, we talked about the illusion of waking consciousness, how in our consciousness we always think uh, it is total and that it's complete. And it's never going to go away. Uh, that's the way it always seems. Like we never think we're going to go to sleep. Like we're we just going to stay awake. And it's going to be that way all the time. It seems like in our consciousness, this is it. This is all there is. There doesn't have to be anything more. There's nothing more to awaken to. That is until we find ourselves with greater consciousness. We should probably be embarrassed, but we're so, so newly, we're so fascinated with the new consciousness that we just rush toward it. Now, this is a very difficult subject because it almost Edgar Edgar's talk was very engaging this afternoon for one point, for other points, but for one point, the difficulty with the increasing consciousness or intermittent consciousness as we have now, is that it seems almost impossible to remember consciousness. It may be possible, but it's very elusive to me. We can remember the effects of consciousness, what happened and under what conditions those effects came about, and uh, we can remember what transpired and came out of the consciousness, but to try to mem remember the consciousness itself is not, not an easy thing to do. We get something like a shadow of it, or we get something like a reflection of it, but not the consciousness itself. You know, if we're in deep prayer, or if we have a moment of discovery, we are in a heightened state of consciousness. We may remember the discovery, and we may have the glow from the prayer that stays with us, but to remember the consciousness itself just doesn't happen. At least it doesn't happen with me, but I may have a limited span of attention. Now, this might be because we're only at the beginning of waking objective consciousness, or it may tell us something about the nature of consciousness itself. It's like Eddie's talk. For us, there aren't any final answers yet. We keep working with it, and maybe someday we will know. The um, involution, or what has transpired in involution, which is the spiritualization of matter, will continue until we have completely spiritualized all of the matter for us in mineral life weight, or what is now 
in the mineral state. Our newest vehicles, like the uh, desire body and the mind, which are very young, are very in their very early stages of development. They have several stages to go through before they're mature, and uh, the spirit has to be, enter into them and become more involved in them and the stuff of them. So this is a, a huge process in which we have to maintain conscious attention. It doesn't have to be uh, nervous attention. It doesn't have to be forced or stressful attention. But more and more, we pay more attention to life. Of course, that's very, very rewarding because what we get out of sacrificing our spiritual uh, lassitude by giving attention to what's going on around us, we're more than rewarded for that in terms of spiritual unfoldment. So this means we come more and more into our bodies and we become more conscious in them and we work through them and we spiritualize them. Now, even though the more subtle bodies are called higher vehicles, uh, this process can only be done when they're mature. No matter how high they are, they have to be mature. We have an analogy for that. We see it all the time in life. If we take a child, we can see that a child is a human being. It's different than a dog, and certainly different than a plant. But we wouldn't expect a four-year-old to father a child or to give birth to a child. We wouldn't expect that at all. We even find it sometimes a little eerie and strange when there's a very young, prodigious manifestation of genius. We somehow sense that that development, because it is so much so soon, is going to result in a short life because uh, genius and uh, creative genius especially and longevity are usually not bed partners with each other. This evolution or this evolutionary outlook is uh, very different from what many people have in their mind, especially from uh, physical or materialistic evolution. Uh, thankfully, uh, it is a step forward from uh, a lot of earlier philosophies, which, is, which teach that we should issue matter and get out of here as quickly as we can. That's not our evolutionary purpose. Our evolutionary purpose is to come completely into matter and pass through it and in so doing transform it into a state of spirit. This is what the spiritualization of matter is all about. And this is what we as creatures do. We take that congealed ignorance that is what matter is and we bring it to the consciousness of spirit. We transform it through a marvelous process of alchemy. It shows that, we're, that we in our consciousness right now are not very far along in that, but certainly gives us uh, something to build toward. Now, some of the early stages of this are found in all cultures and in all religions. For example, in the West, we have the example of Moses, who right before his death brought the spirit so much into the body and spiritualized the body, the dense physical body, that the dense physical body radiated light. This is indeed a materialization of spirit. I don't know whether uh, the entire form, the archetype of it, and whether all of the atoms of the material stuff were completely spiritualized, but this is a pretty advanced state. Max Heindel tells us that a similar thing happened when uh, the Christ being was uh, incarnated, incarnated in the body of Jesus and in what is called the Mount of Transfiguration when he was apart with the disciples Peter, James, and John. The dense physical body also glowed with the spiritual light. Uh, probably one of the most hair-raising parts of the, uh, of the entire New Testament. 
So from these examples, we can see the process in childhood, and we can see the beginnings of the accomplishment of it through Moses and Jesus. Now, as far as I can tell, this is a work that most of us have not really done. I don't often feel really aware in my physical body or of it. Now, as a prelude or as an overture, uh, the increasingly self-conscious activity within the chemical region of the physical world is where we begin to do that work. We can do that right now. We can do it like with physical culture. We can do it with art. Uh, I had friends that were minds, and they used to paint one fingernail a different color. And then for an entire month, while that fingernail was painted purple, painted purple, they tried to be aware of that finger and everything that happened in that finger. It's a wonderful kind of exercise. Uh, we can do it with, you know, doing physical things, doing alchemy, doing art, all of those things. Now, this whole process has been symbol, symbolized at, by a series of mathematical figures. You could say you can begin with uh, three points, which is kind of an unfair one. You could say, say two planes in a point. But what it is, is this is the central focus of our entire being, which is at the core of the concrete mind, where the abstract meets the concrete. At another stage of evolution, the spirit reaches down toward matter, and uh, matter, by increasingly subtle vehicles with different qualities to them, reach closer to matter. Then you come to the point where we are at now. That is, spirit is just touching on its vehicles and is just becoming aware and self-conscious of the external side of the evolutionary creation. We're at the very, very beginning of that. Uh, eventually, we come to a stage where we, where the spirit begins passing into matter, and matter begins passing into spirit. These are all symbols that have been used at various times in symbolic language in all of the mysteries. And then the stage that is final is when matter has passed all the way through spirit, and spirit has passed all the way through matter. This is called having the diamond or adamantine body. Except this symbol is very difficult, just like the first one is very difficult, because at the same time, that matter is passing all the way into spirit, and spirit is passing all the way into matter. The whole business is collapsing. And so that really what it ends up is everything is back at a point. You can do all three dimensional figures, but uh, so what we're trying to do two is enough. I, there, is a, there is a three dimensional uh, figure like that in the other room. Uh, but we'd have to get into all kinds of spiritual mathematics, and I'm not prepared to do that right now. All right. So this brings us back to a topic uh, that we have begun in the talk preceding this. We have not gotten anywhere with it. Again, we're talking about the evolution of consciousness. And we're looking at it from the human perspective, our part in it, what we are doing. The topic that we began yesterday is the topic of the relationship of thinking and consciousness. Now, the Rosicrucian philosophy, in its philosophy lessons, not the primary, but in the secondary lessons, teaches that there are three objectives in the evolutionary creation. First is experience, waking self-conscious objective experience. The second is soul power, generated through that experience, 
small power that makes us divinities because our portion of the matter that has been spiritualized as soul and comes into the spirit is our creative potency for the future. And the third objective is creative mind. And it is that last objective, the creative mind, that we're going to talk about uh, for the remainder of this talk. Now, in the preceding talk last evening, it was said that waking consciousness begins when the threefold spirit, the self, the spiritual ego, begins to enter the threefold body and uh, through a fourth vehicle. And that that fourth vehicle is a focus and a link between spirit and bodies. We talked about it, especially in that image of the light focusing to a point and passing through that point uh, as a lens and as a mirror and knowing itself in the process. Now, in all of this, we realize that consciousness is capable of anything. There is no limit to the potential of consciousness. However, there are specific kinds of consciousness that we have been gifted uh, with the potentiality of by the evolutionary creative process. We were created to learn specific things, many of them, but very simple, basic ones, by the divine creative hierarchies within the universal spirit. Every religion, every spiritual path throughout the history of humanity has talked about divine beings within the universal spirit, spiritual beings that have created not only the universe but everything in it, within the one, which remains the one by not being uh, hands-on in everything. We have it in Christianity. We hear about cherubim and seraphim and the other Elohim in the Bible. Our participation in the involution, in the building of our bodies, has been unconscious, at least so far. We can now enter into a conscious life. So we have been receivers. We have been recipients of their guests, of their gifts, and we are becoming creative beings. Because when we take their gifts, we ourselves in turn become creators. But during the entire involution, we have been takers or receivers. This is what is meant when Christ Jesus says, it is better to give than to receive. He doesn't mean to upset the balance between giving and receiving. He's telling us that here before you've been receivers, now it is better for you to be givers. That's, that's what we're uh, uh, meant to do now. Now, as we've said, we are creatures. And as creatures, we are like infants or little children. And every need that we had in evolution, every need that we were unconscious of, to unfold the best possible balanced consciousness that could be in this kind of evolutionary creation, every need was taken care of. Everything was brought to us. All of this was in the grand creation. All of this was in the realization of the dream of the universal spirit. Now, realized or realization is a very key principle in this. It's a word that we use all the time, but we don't think very much about it. Realize means to make real. If we have a dream and we make it real, we have realized it. Or if, if we have an aspiration to accomplish something and we accomplish it, we say, well, I've realized my dream. 
Now, before the waking consciousness that we have now, uh, we had sort of a vague semi-consciousness to our being. It was analogous, and it is recapitulated in childhood. When a little child will say, uh, Tommy wants a ball, rather than someone who is older and approaching adulthood will say, I want a ball, because the self-consciousness is there now. We were looking at ourselves from the objectivity of the group spirit, and therefore the personality, that separated part, was seen with the group consciousness, and therefore he would say something like Tommy, rather than I. And that is the kind of consciousness that uh, we're speaking of. It's hard to tell when a child loses that macrocosmic consciousness and becomes self-consciously aware. Similarly, when we first began to have the waking self-consciousness, when it was very, very dim, which is symbolized in the Bible by the story of Adam and Eve, it says Adam and Eve saw their nakedness and they covered themselves. Now, if you read the story like relating to things that we see every day, like we get dressed in two or three minutes every morning, faster if we can <laughs> help it. I'm talking from the male perspective here. Being in the male body takes only two minutes to dress. This, this whole process didn't happen in a moment. It didn't happen in the blink of an eye. The eye that we see with and the self-conscious process of being able to see through it co-evolved over a very, very long time. The moment of awakening is just like it's hard to tell the moment of awakening when a child first uses the eye. So this moment of awakening, whether it is in the individual or in humanity in the course of the evolutionary creation, it is a long period and it is a manifold activity. As we've seen in the last couple of days, this threefold spirit was built, organized, and brought into being and readiness for over a long course of time, over three periods. But it had to be awakened. We had to know we had a self before we could be self-conscious. So in the talk previous to this, we described a process whereby the focus of attention was brought to a focusing and a focal agency that was at the same time reflective as it was projective. This was begun when we were unconscious and when we were under the direction of the creative hierarchies. We've always been under the Correction under the direction of the creative hierarchies. Yes, and some like me are always under the correction of the creative hierarchies. <laughs> Got to put you to put this guy straight. Uh, the becoming self was brought to near waking consciousness through experiences in its vehicles. It's important we have to be in the vehicles to become awake especially the dense physical vehicle. We're going to talk a lot about that tomorrow evening. Now, our current conditions are very different, but we can see the parallel in animals and in their vehicles of consciousness. Now, our pets who are close to us are approaching individuation. They know when they're being spoken to individually and they know much of the meaning uh, of what is being spoken to them without having to go through the group spirit. But they don't have an I am. They cannot volitionally ratiocinate, which is a step that they're not ready for yet. They're highly aware of their bodies, and they can do things in their bodies that we can't because we have so much ego resistance. We have so much doubt and we have so much internal division between the true and false self within ourselves. 
If we didn't have that, we would be like people who don't have that division. People that we find in mental institutions. We're a little scrawny person that takes four or five uh, husky, burly aids to subdue that person and hold them down. They don't have the ego restraining them. The high price to pay for that uh, ego state. At any rate, the pre-self-consciousness is a very, very gradual thing. Nonetheless, the moment and the moments of awakening to self-conscious existence is momentous. It's a very important experience. I can remember in this rebirth, the first time I had a creative thought. I can remember the feeling of it. I can't remember the consciousness. I can't remember the, what the thought was, but it felt so wonderful because I had recognized other people who were creative thinkers. And, and for me, I hate to say that, the wonderful things come out in giving these thoughts, things that never come out when you're alone. But there's a special thing when you're putting together the notes for a, for a talk and you're all by yourself alone and you're going as deep as you can in your concentration and there are moments of open consciousness that are unlike any other time. And for me, it's really wonderful. But the moment, the long-term or short-term, is a gigantic cosmic deja vu. We are awakening to what we have longed for, what we have sensed over eons and eons in this whole process that is symbolized by these geometric figures. Uh, and when we awaken to that, to say, ah, I knew it all along. And uh, we no longer think of us as the little pipsqueaky human beings that we are now, we know that we're divine. And at the same time, we're humbled. We're humbled because of what we really are. It awes the even lower nature so much that we're almost ashamed for the pettiness of our expression through that lower nature. If we are constant, and we are attentive in our lives, we sense this in an ongoing way. It's really hard, but if we can maintain a span of consciousness where we are continuously attentive, it will become what the whole second half of evolution will be. It will be a gigantic aha like what, I've all, what it always was meant to be. That's, that's what the future is to be. Now, there is potential illusion and misunderstanding in all of this, and there's something that is ironically paradoxical. So to begin to understand this, and we may not be able to be successful in understanding this, let's go back to the painter and the picture. I happen to be very fond of Impressionists. And probably above all of them, I am uh, a lover of Monet, Claude Monet. And I've gone to several shows that were exclusively Monet shows. I remember one instance in uh, the Art Institute in Chicago. I was looking at a Monet. Instead of looking at its splendor, and all of the tapering, subtle effects of light and color, I walked right up to it. I got as close to it as I am to this light. You know what I saw? Tiny little dots of paint. Nothing. They, were, they weren't even connected. Tiny little dots of paint. It didn't become even a vague outline of a picture until you got several feet back. And then when you got back far enough, it was just a marvelous, marvelous kind of landscape. And then I found out that all of those paintings were like that. It makes you wonder, in the first place, how Monet did them, because his arms weren't, weren't long enough. He had to have a stupendous memory and a stupendous imagination and have that sense exactly just what kind of color to have and to go up there and just where, know where to put each and every dot. That's kind of a genius in itself. 
Uh, but it was a wondrous expression of beauty, but at the same time, from one perspective, it was an illusion, a gigantic illusion of dots. I have uh, spoken to painters who have had troubling ego problems, and many of them could not deal with the juxtaposition of the artistic genius in relation to the poesity of character in their personal lives. And what happened is, is that many of them actually believed that they were magicians, that they could create these illusions and they could bring this beauty about, but they weren't appreciated enough. And many of them, there was due reason why they weren't appreciated with that kind of egoism. Other painters sometimes begin to doubt all reality at all and think it's all an illusion, that the atoms are just like dots of paint. And they're justified in asking whether these things are real. Because the real, or that which they're trying to realize, is realized through the dots of paint, or it is realized through the atoms, but it isn't them. And if you're attached to the dots of paint, you're not going to uh, see the reality that is realized. This is something of what it's like in the uh, materialization of spirit. Some would say, and there's an awful lot to it, that it's all a matter of perspective. That if we could just step back, that we would see it and we would know ultimate reality. Others would say, and there's something to what they have to say about it too, that it is the overarching consciousness of the painter and not the perspective that gives reality to the painting. All of these views have something that is worthwhile, but they also have hitches to them and snags to them. You can look at them because they're covered by various forms of philosophy, either academic or secular philosophy, or even spiritual philosophy. Uh, different people only see different parts of the picture. So all along, we've been alluding to the evolutionary creation as a creative dream. We've even likened it to the work of an artist. We might ask then, what makes reality real? Or how are the unconscious potentials realized and awakened? Realized and awakened right, awakened right down to every atom not just a mere convenience, it is a living reality, each and every atom. Some would say that since God does it and God is reality, that makes it real. It's a nice answer, it's a good beginning answer, but it really isn't satisfying, not satisfying at all. As far as I can understand it, and my answer might be as shallow and simplistic as that, it's a matter of giving. All out sacrificial creative giving. Since the time of the Greeks, we have been admonished, know thyself. In Greek, it is no te se autan. No by self. When we work at that in our spiritual exercises, we progressively become familiar with what our selfhood is and what our being is. We're no longer foreign and strangers to ourselves. We become more peaceful. We become intimate in our own being. When we do so, and somebody else projects a thought to us or we unconsciously pick one up, we know immediately it's not our own. We can't be fooled because we know what our thoughts feel like because we're, we know ourselves. 
more and more we know what's real about ourselves and what is a wish and what is a dream that hasn't come to maturity in us yet. We know when we're kidding ourselves. So if that is true about us in our diminished consciousness, it must also be true for the universal spirit, for God, if you like to use that word. The universal spirit could not fool itself to believe that its creative dream was reality. It knows better. It knows itself in this better than that. However, it also knows that there is potential. Potential of more spiritual awake, awakening consciousness and more foci of it through which that can come about. So the universal spirit is filled with love. And like the painter, it must give. We need, the spirit needs us as much as we need the spirit. The spirit knows it's going to continue to exist because it has no internal or external resistances, but to fulfill its nature as a creative, loving being, it needs us. Different kind of need. We need it a little to just continue to exist right then and there. So it must give. And the giving of the universal spirit doesn't end with the projection of the dream. So it gives, and it gives of itself entirely. It gives itself to the dream. It sacrifices and gives all of itself. And it so enters the, into the dream that there's all loss of self, and it is identified with the dream. And in that kind of process, it has gone beyond itself or its selfness, and it has gone out of itself and its selfness and into that. And because it has sacrificed everything it's got in an ultimate way, that realizes the dream. Because all of the reality that belonged to the universal spirit now belongs to evolutionary creation. Not kind of vague in its beginning thought, but this is apparently the way it works in the uh, evolutionary creation in which we are very, very fortunate to participate. What happens in macrocosm happens in microcosm. As above, so below. What has gone before in heaven follow after on earth. Know this and rejoice. It's the hermetic axiom. As we come to consciousness and as we know ourselves, we know what we are and what we aren't. Even with our rudimentary self-consciousness, we know that we are conscious beings. We also know we aren't our bodies, but that our bodies have something to do with our consciousness. In fact, it's kind of hard to be conscious without one. In a way, we partially know what we are by knowing what we are not, which to some extent includes our bodies. We came to self-knowledge by discriminating spirit from matter, which is matter being associated with the unknown. This is the self, not self, thing that we were talking about last evening. We carried that kind of consciousness to some extent even into the spiritual world. Now the Bible exhorts us to try the spirits and find them wanting. By this, it is basically meant separative spirit 
is a unity, or each spirit is a unity, and it is unified. We want consciousness, and consciousness is in and of the spirit. We said that several times now. Even though we may have cut our finger, it's registered in the nerves, carried to the etheric brain, through the etheric brain to the desire body, where the experience of feeling, not the, not the central feeling of interest and indifference, but it certainly does. It's kind of hard to be indifferent when you've got a cut and it's hurting. And there it is, the feeling is enlivened in the desire body. But it is the spirit that is conscious of the feeling. So uh, the consciousness is always in the spirit. So we want consciousness. Our means must be the same as the universal spirit. Because we are spirits, the Bible tells that. You are, know ye not that ye are spirits? And the Bible also tells us that we are made in the image of God. And if God is a spirit, we must be a spirit. So that is our reality. Now when we have consciousness, our bodies, and when we see that they are not us, the spirit, we sort of understand that they are not us, not only because they are not the spirit, but because they belong to the gods. The gods who projected their very being into our various vehicles as they were formed. And we can't completely enter and spiritualize our beings and to spiritualize the matter of our vehicle of consciousness as long as the gods are in them. So, uh, this is the task that we have before us. This is an enormous order, order for us, but fortunately talk is cheap, and uh, we can talk about big, big shot spiritual matters as though we really knew. Uh, that's sort of a statement of what my life is. Now, <coughs> the accomplishment of this objective or of these objectives of uh, removing the divine hierarchies from our being is an extension of what we've been talking about all along. It's always like that in an evolutionary creation. Everything is analogous because everything is within the one. So our lives, our service, what we offer to the cosmos is the means that we accomplish by. It's not something foreign, it's something in us all along. Now, we mentioned a few minutes ago how thinking awakens the transcendent threefold spirit. It activates it, it empowers it, because in the process of thinking and bringing the thoughts into our body, the spirit comes alive. Thinking is our human work, our human service. Minerals give us stable form, Plants give us vital life. Animals give us pure, simple, basic motivation by desire. We humans, what we give to the universe is thought. We can use and we can improve and we can execute our services by thinking. We do other things, but the thinking is really important. We are the only self-conscious thinking beings in this externalized three-dimensional world. And now we're going to see that through this process is how we become the divine beings that we are becoming. We do this when and as we do any concentrated thinking. From the very center of our being, 
which is at the very center of the mind. And on one side of one hemisphere, you might say, of the center of the mind is the spirit, and at the other hemisphere is the bodies. Whenever we bring new spiritual awareness to life, as we do when we do healing prayer, for example. That's a special time for us during the week when we take from the spiritual worlds and concentrating as well as we can concentrate and bringing it through into this physical world. We are doing that. We are materializing spirit, which at the same time has the effect of spiritualizing matter. So, every time we do this kind of thinking and think for ourselves, we begin to evict the gods. Now, eviction is probably not the best word, but it's a strong word, and it's a strong word that can bring to our consciousness how important it is. It's analogous to what takes place when a child uh, goes through adolescence and rebels against the parents, it wants to throw the parents off. What it really amounts to do is doing is throwing itself off, which has the same effect, I guess. But uh, the word evict is not a grateful word. And above all, it's not a creative word. It's not valid to really say to liberate the gods, but that's part of it, because the gods uh, are straining in keeping us together as we are together, and they would like to be free to go on to other things. In some way, because we're so slow about our spiritual growth, we're like children who don't mature. We don't go out into the world. We're like those kids that are 45 years old and still living with mommy and daddy. Uh, they don't move on to other things in an independent way. How we do this is similar to what we see in the procession of generations. Before we can evict the gods, we have to be strong enough. We have to be capable enough and we have to be independent enough to do so. So it is important for us now to study and ponder just exactly what the influence of the gods is in us. We can do this by noting where we are uncomfortable, where we feel unfree in our being, where we feel like we're impotent right now. Some things, you, even just beginning things, you can get by looking at a physiology book and an astrology book and the Cosmo Conception. It's a wonderful way to begin. But let's, we're talking about it in a more active way. We do this every time we're seriously ill. Because when we're seriously ill, one of our organs or one of our systems, which are direct expressions of the gods, we understand that we're not using it right or we don't understand it right or it's not our own. So illness in a way is a blessing. It's not only a retrieval of a, a bad destiny. It's something that wakes us up. And it's something that makes us aware of the fact that we are not really in control of our bodies. Studying cosmological astrology and the creative hierarchies is a way we can do this. Any time we can see through how any part of our dense physical body works and functions, and we can see the functions of the hierarchies in ourselves and learn to express the qualities of those functions in our consciousness, we are doing this whether we do this in the little of life or whether we do it in the large of life. There is one activity in which we are at the very beginning and
and that is of very high importance, of primary, primary importance. That is creative activity. If we wish to become divine beings, if we wish to be fulfilled, we must be creative beings. Now, evicting the gods, again, might not have been a good choice because it connotes images of beings and uh, possessions out at the curbside and the sheriff there enforcing that you don't get back in. And beside that, there's no you know, cosmic emptiness in which we can be booted. The process is a process not of eviction, but of replacement. Replacement. The replacement of one influence with another. With an influence coming from other beings with an influence that comes from ourselves. And this is going to be a long, slow process of millions of years, but it is an important process. Rod uh, Lakes, tomorrow afternoon, is going to give us a talk about thought substitution. How we can begin every day to when we have a thought that we don't want to have, we have the freedom to replace that thought with a positive thought. That is creative living. Very creative living. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about creative giving. Because we are becoming like the gods. And if we want to replace their influence, we must ourselves become creative givers. We no longer want to be takers. So we progressively assume the responsibility of creating and developing our dense physical bodies. We not only spiritualize the form and make it completely ours, we give something of our spiritual being in the material into the materials of them. As above, so below. What the gods did for us, we are doing for the creatures that are our charges. When we give of ourselves in simple creative things like baking a cake, if we do it correctly, if we do it with waking consciousness, what we are doing is to the minerals that are in that cake, we are getting rid of the influence of the gods by replacing them with something in ourself, not in a selfish way, but in an unselfish way, in a way of giving to something else. So this is a gigantic analogous process where we pass things on. The only difference from hand-me-down clothes is, is that with each successive passing, things become better rather than more tattered. This is the kind of thing that we want to do. Every, just even having a different attitude about how we greet our neighbor. Anything that we can be creatively alive. Any way that we can look at the world differently than we've ever looked at it before. You know, we're pretty conventional people. We're almost like lawyers. For lawyers, they set precedents, and those precedents stand forever and ever, and, and law is a matter of uh, understanding what's cut and dried and what isn't. We don't want to be like that. We want to create. We want to look at things in different ways, because every time we do, we are fulfilling another facet of the miracle of the evolutionary creation of God. That's a big thing. Our little lives, our daily things, if I pull weeds in the garden, it's the same thing. Right now, we are infantile in this work. Some of what we do in an academic way, we study phys physiology or organic chemistry, or we try stupid experiments like artificial organs and such. But even so, these are baby steps where something is done. But as we gain control of ourselves and as we bring the general will of the spirit to bear in the process of thinking, we add wisdom. 
we add creative imagination and eventually we'll build super bodies and they'll be all ours at the same time they're going into decadence of course but that's all right and, you know a body today here today gone tomorrow that kind of a thing and we master ourselves the Rosicrucian philosophy teaches that in the next great period of the evolutionary creation which is called the Jupiter period when things are only as dense as the ethers we will be able to take the stuff that is now in the mineral kingdom and bring it to life we will make plants out of it and we will pass on what we have learned about vitality and that same thing of life spirit that we have learned will also be passed on I, though I don't know we will be capable of doing that directly when we develop the vegetable state of creative thinking we go deeper into the recesses of our mind as long as we deal only with form and shape and texture and the nature of substance we are in what is called the shallowest region of the concrete mind which is called the continental region of the mind but when we go deeper into our own mind in order to think life and to evict the beings that have radiated the vital body into ourselves by ourselves giving vitality to becoming beings to new creatures that we love into existence we pass that on we give where we have received in the next great period which is called in the Rosicrucian philosophy the Venus period when the cosmos will be no more dense than a, than a desire we bring our desire bodies to completion and we externalize them and all of the agencies that birthed the desire body and radiated it into us the archangels and uh, the other uh, hierarchies that were specifically involved with our desire bodies and we will then produce animal like beings that can objectively stand out there and live and move by our consciousness this is some you know there are people that have learned to even do these things already even without being able to bring them to life and motivation and motility there are people that can imagine things that everybody in the room can see it as though I were having a green balloon in my hand you can just see something like that and in the final period of the creation the Vulcan period everything becomes even more far-fetched and almost incomprehensible to our current kind of consciousness we will be able to go not to the aerial region where we had the desire the thoughts of emotion but we will go to the archetypal region of concrete thought in the heart of the heart of our being and our connection with the absolute through the virgin spirit that point that we began with at the very beginning of the whole thing that was the beginning of that little ball that we were so to speak in the Saturn period we go right through that and we bring the divinity through that and the mind collapses right into the spirit and we bring into into being new thinking beings who can do it for themselves and then they're free as we are free and in the process we've gained all this experience there's all this soul power there's all this new light there has been something that has never ever been before in, turn, in eternity has been realized this is what the uniqueness of creation is all about everything that we do in this fashion is unique it will never be repeated there are a lot of repetitions that things are similar and it takes us a while to learn lessons but when we live creatively even in the simplest things possible that we do yet we are making something unique that has never been before therefore it behooves us to day by day to be inventive people 
to be creative people. That doesn't mean we leave our job and become Van Goghs or something like that. Uh, but we uh, are inventive. We have unique outlooks on things. It's been satisfying to sit through these presentations we've been having at this summer school because in these presentations there are a lot of unique points of view. And you can see that people are self-conscious in their daily lives. And in that self-consciousness, they're learning things about the whole process and they're bringing love, creative love to it. And so I think that everybody in this room and everybody that has presented is actually at this work. So this is a rather sketchy idea about it, a very sketchy description of it all, but I think you get the basic idea. In this, there are simple principles that as we grow in consciousness, we become more creative and outward. We are meant to be outward beings. We go into ourselves to give outward light. Another principle is that as we become creators, we are not separate as we are now. We participate progressively more in the cosmic creation with all the other spirits. When the universal spirit is giving itself to the ultimate in the evolutionary creation, which is the only way it can be realized, if we understand that it is doing that through us, that that process is taking place in us through our consciousness. I can't think of anything higher than that. So we now have a little bit of an idea of uh, the general process of awakening consciousness. And what we're going to do tomorrow evening is we're going to speak about a specific activity of working with consciousness. Uh, we're not going to talk about how to paint a picture or anything like that, but we're going to talk about it, about the attitudes that are in our lives in a way that you may not uh, really be familiar with them, but we'll try to give all kinds of examples. And for now, we'll close with the Rosicrucian student's prayer. Oh God, increase our love for thee so that we may serve thee better from day to day. Let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer.